morning, everyone. Great session this morning, by the way. Really, really enjoying it. Thanks for the opportunity to participate. So uh, I'm going to show uh, six quick innovations uh, in eight minutes. Uh, one piece of data, one technique with some data, three quick techniques and needs, uh, sort of appeal to industry, and a final quick word on education. So uh, there were three historic observational studies that suggested lower rates of acute kidney injury after radial compared with femoral PCI. Now this, the discussion around these usually centered around whether this was just unmeasured confounders, was there some selection bias despite the propensity matching, maybe these were low-risk patients and that explained it. But there is some biologic plausibility. If you think about it, these are human abdominal aortas opened out and mapped. There's a gradient of plaque from higher to lower. So there's a much higher risk of atheroembolization by crossing from the femoral artery compared with the radial artery. Also, perhaps bleeding or transfusion rates in femoral push up the risk of acute kidney injury. And it kind of makes sense that your radial patient who sits up immediately, starts drinking and walks around and eating, perhaps that has some physiologic role in risk of acute kidney injury after the procedure. So that the innovative uh, study to highlight is this. It's the uh, pre-specified sub-study of the MATRIX trial, the AKI MATRIX trial, 8,400 patients, randomized trial, importantly, so that there's no confounding here. And patients in both the radial and femoral arm were very well matched for procedural parameters, including contrast volumes. And you see there in the primary endpoint, there was a significantly lower rate of acute kidney injury after radial PCI compared with femoral PCI. I think this is critically important and highly innovative uh, information. And go across the bottom there, all other classifications of renal dysfunction after PCI were lower with the radial arm. So lower rates of AKI with radial, fewer patients statistically significantly fewer patients progress to dialysis. Those patients at highest risk with the highest risk renal scores benefited the most. And I think this has major implications for renal preservation after PCI, both in your regular patient and in patients at higher risk. Second innovation is in the field of radial artery occlusion. We know, and I'm sure you all practice patent hemostasis because maintaining radial flow during compression of that artery reduces risk of subsequent occlusion. It's been shown that ulnar artery occlusion on the same side diverts blood from the ulna down the radial artery and improves flow into the radial artery. So Sam Pancholi and colleagues asked the question and designed the PROFIT-2 trial. 3,000 patients who were randomized to either standard patent hemostasis versus patent hemostasis and adjunctive ulnar compression, so compression of the ulnar artery at the same time as patent hemostasis. And they assessed a radial artery occlusion by plethysmography immediately after the procedure 24 hours later. Well, here's the data. So blue is uh, your standard patent hemostasis that I'm sure you all do. The first piece of information to point out is the rate of radial artery occlusion goes down, so there is spontaneous recanalization in those very early occlusions, even with standard measures. And in pink, you'll see that with ulnar compression, a markedly lower rate of radial artery occlusion. So it fits with the physiology. You press the ulna, it diverts blood to the radial artery and reduces the risk of subsequent occlusion. Here's uh, some of Sam's videos. This is how to do it. So he's taken a needle cap, you know, your little plastic cap uh, that comes off the anesthesia needle, rolled it up in some gauze to make a pledget here, very simple. He has this old-fashioned radial band centered over the ulnar artery, and he's palpating the ulnar artery over here, and he's going to insert that pledget just over his ulnar artery uh, here, and then tighten up the band. Uh, really quite straightforward here. And then he'll just remove the uh, uh, radial artery sheath as usual and compress with that band. One thing I did note, and I, I don't do this, but Sam always opens that side port of the sheath as he pulls the sheath out. And it kind of makes sense that that will aspirate and bleed out any thrombus that may be present at the arteriotomy site. So I'm going to do that from now on. Third innovation uh, is a very simple one, I think. This is a 56-year-old female with class 4 angina. She's an MD, and she refused sedation. And uh, as you can see here, there was severe spasm in the radial artery. And this was sheath entrapment. We could not remove this sheath. And you all will know that the standard treatment for a sheath entrapment due to spasm 
is to try conservative measures, to increase the sedation. I'm sure you've all been here with us, use extra vasodilators, and the pressures drop, and you're giving fluids, and it's all kind of getting a little bit messy. And then you're thinking about propofol, general anesthesia, auxiliary nerve blocks, and all those sorts of things. But I'd encourage you to think about this very simple strategy. And I want to highlight Dr. Purna, who's a fellow who brought this up at one of uh, Sunil's radial courses, and we all tried this and published it. But if you inflate a blood pressure cuff in the usual place for five minutes at high pressures, deflate, there is flow-mediated dilation. This is that old-fashioned physiologic strategy, and this actually does work. And I'd encourage you to try this before you go to those more aggressive maneuvers, such as propofol and general anesthesia. This is the patient. So here is her baseline, and you'll see on the right, it's a little better. Sure, it's not perfect, but it's a little better, and it was uh, enough dilation for us to remove that sheath without resorting to those aggressive measures. Fourth innovation, sheathless uh, for large bore intervention. This is a, um, um, a very important technique that people should know. If you need a seven and a half or eight French guide, you can remove your six French sheath and replace it. This is with a commercial sheathless guide. It has the same outer diameter as a six French sheath, a beautiful tapered white dilator, a hydrophilic 7.5 French sheath. You can do two millimeter rosablation, two large stents for distal left main bifurcation treatment without uh, overstretch of that radial artery. I think this is fantastic. Fantastic technology, use it a lot. The problem is you don't need the hydrophilic coating and you only have restricted uh, guide types. So how are you going to use other eight French guides when you want to? Well, we have these homemade technologies and we have our homemade tapers that we use to introduce the guide into the radial artery. This is balloon-assisted taper, an 014 wire. The taper is very short. It's a little tough to push through, but it can be successful. We have catheter-assisted taper. Here's a long multi-purpose diagnostic. But you'll see the transitions at the wire and the guide are not perfect, and there will be increased discomfort and uh, a trauma as you advance it into the radial artery. What we really need, and it's an appeal to industry, is dilator-assisted tapering, just a simple taper dilator that we can take off the shelf and put in any eight French guide that we like that will introduce and advance into the radial artery. That's what we need. I've been saying this for a few years. No one listens to me. Anyway, number five, you've heard from uh, Manish that the left radial is associated with left, uh, less subclavian tortuosity, but there are issues, as he outlined. It's awkward for the operator. It's awkward for the patient to keep that left wrist supinated as you bring it across the body. So I want to highlight Kimney here, one of our fathers in the radial space, remains very innovative, and he's uh, invented or discovered or that you can use the distal left radial artery. You'll I'll be feeling now for the next few minutes your anatomic snuff box. You'll feel a pulsatile branch of the radial artery. This is actually our case from a couple of days ago as we're withdrawing the sheath. You can access this with ultrasound, and the patient can keep their arm across very comfortably. Uh, you can access it from the right, uh, and it's a really nice technique to think about. Here's the wire going up from the distal left radial axis. There is a bone underneath the hemostasis. There is an extra bend here because the arm is a little bit bent at the elbow, and this may introduce some tortuosity. And you see here, we use balloon assisted tracking to get the catheter up, and hemostosis is very straightforward with the compression band. Final one word is in the field of education. This has been an absolutely incredible meeting. I do think uh, the complementary social media is going to be very valuable for the radial space. We've seen a uh, radial first hashtag, and this is the brainchild of Sunil Rao, of Sheila Sani, and Chada al -Rais. As of this morning, there have been 20, uh, sorry, 17 million impressions radial first in the last six months in this invented. I've loved this. It's shown us new techniques. We can do instantaneous Twitter surveys and see what our colleagues are doing. So to summarize, uh, six quick innovations, acute kidney injury, ulnar compression, blood pressure cuff, sheathless, distal left radial artery, and of course, you always have the femoral. Uh, I'll leave you with this final slide. <laughs>